Okay. Okay, it's working. Right. Okay, welcome everybody. We're just gonna wait a few seconds for everybody to come in and we'll start. Okay, so I think I will start. So welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we set seminars. Today the speaker is Francesco Squintani, who is going to talk to us about optimal overspecified contracts. We also have Luca Anderlini as a panelist here with us. Alvaro Sandroni hasn't joined yet, but he might uh, later on. Uh, just to remind you that uh, the talk is recorded. Uh, it's about an hour plus 15 minutes later for questions. When we are done, we'll move to the virtual chair environment. We'll send the link Put the link in the chat. Um, if you have questions, uh, Francesco, are you happy for people to ask directly or do you want to, because it's only you. Yes, so perhaps, absolutely. Yeah, just unmute yourselves and ask the question. Yeah. Um, just a reminder that next uh, week we have Simone Galperti, who's going to talk about false narratives in political mobilization with, uh, it's a joint work with Kefir Elias and Hans Spiegler, guest panelists Gira Levy and Andrea Pratt. Okay. I'm just going to pass the floor over to Francesco and uh, you may begin. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francesco. It's a pleasure being here. Um, now, uh, let me talk about over-specified contracts. Now, over-specified contracts in, uh, in this paper are defined as contracts that include clauses that are not enforceable. And uh, the use of such contracts to achieve the intended outcome is not uncommon in, in some uh, areas of uh, uh, law. Say, for example, in commerce, uh, if you read the legal literature, you have uh, some uh, fair, actually fairly uh, old by now uh, accounts, uh, you know, kind of classical accounts, they report that the practice of uh, economic interactions may be very different from the contracts that are signed. Say, for example, sellers commit to provide uh, highest grade commodities, but buyers are very often satisfied with lower specifications. Or in general, contracts include a number of boilerplate clauses that the parties, the economic parties ignore in the practice of their interactions. And one of the reasons that uh, people in the law and economics literature or legal scholars have identified for this distinction between what's written on the contract and what is done in practice is that Penalties for under provision are very often, are usually, in fact, not very often limited to compensation of verifiable damages. So uh, the idea is that by making, over-specifying the quality of the goods that are to be traded, uh, this gives better incentives for the sellers to actually provide the goods of the quality that the sellers and the buyers intend to achieve. Another example of the, this form of uh, over-specification of contracts, in my opinion, are professional contracts that include clauses such as the provision of services according to best practice. Now, at least to me, it's very difficult to even have a sense of what this could mean in practice. And it's in any way, it's very difficult to verify if such provision according to best practices took place. So what is the point of this paper? Well, the point of this paper is to identify environments where the first best is only achieved with contracts that include clauses that cannot be enforced. So some of the contingent transfers that are included in a contract will not be enforced if uh, uh, the, uh, the parties take the case to court. And, uh, this is the only way to achieve the intended outcome in the, in the instances that I will show in the talk, 
because uh, if the parties were to contractually commit to the first best outcome, then they would achieve to fail to, to achieve, they would fail to achieve the first best. So in practice, what happens is that the, co the parties contractually commit to a suboptimal outcome, and then they secretly violate the contract to play the first best. Now, I want to point out that this is not contract renegotiation because the contract breach is kept secret. There is, the contract stays the same throughout the process. I want to point out that these are not relational contracts. I mean, in the sense that the instances that I will identify of this in this paper are not relational contracts. However, uh, I mean, another reasoning for what, another reason for why a specified contract may be useful is related to relational contracts. And so while this is not what I do here, I'm not dismissing the importance of relational contracts here. I want to point out that this is not an instance of contract incompleteness. To the contrary, here contracts are overspecified in the sense that they contain unenforceable clauses. In fact, the closest thing that, we, that I can think of to this type of phenomenon is as a failure of the revelation principle. And I will show you how the relationship uh, is formal, form, the formal relationship. Uh, Francisco, can I, can I ask a question? I, I think it's terminology, really. Yeah. The, 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 the example with the best practices, that's, you know, uh, that's not an overspecified contract. That's, a, that's an optimally uh, incomplete, con optimally vague contract yeah no I or, mean, uh, you know in, in ju just about every every road uh, uh, code in that I know of there is there is a there is a rule that says that you can't you shouldn't drive dangerously I mean <laughs> yeah, of course you shouldn't drive dangerously but that's not a no no that's that's fine I mean it's, it's just terminology I think but no very well now that's an excellent question because it underlines a distinction between something that I did and something that in fact you did not only you, but uh, now there is a way to think about this idea of dangerously, right? For example, as an incomplete contract. And then on a case by case basis, the court will fill in what dangerous, dangerously means, right? Just like according to best practices, could be as, you know, a vague. Uh, reference to something that then will be decided in court as a way to complete the contract. And in fact, in your work with, uh, with Leonardo and uh, Andy, you showed that when the court has the ability to complete the contract, so to determine what is the, the right, what, what a vague clause should be, should mean in, in court, then it becomes optimal to uh, leave the contract incomplete. Now here I'm going to do something different. Here I'm going to define contracts with contingencies that cannot be enforced in the sense that, for example, the contingencies make differences, may, are different for uh, conting so the transfers are different for contingencies that the court cannot verify. But I will show how this is the optimal way to proceed. So for example, if as a seller, I commit to give you a good or quality 100, but then in equilibrium, I give you 90, and we know that this is what we intended to do in the first place, then we are in the presence of an overspecified contract. If instead the contract is intentionally left vague with the idea that then either the parties or the court will fill in the gaps, then we are in the presence of an optimal incomplete. Yeah. So it's not so the key, key difference is the key difference is that here the courts we're, we're not talking about courts discretion. We're just talking the courts can no. either enforce or not enforce. Period. And yeah, I mean on that there, basis there is going to be a component of court discretion in the sense that when the court cannot enforce the contract, she can do something else. So, but the key, the key point that I'm making is this. Let's consider a contract that makes different contingency, contingent transfers 
if the state, if the realized state of the world, let's say, or if the, the action that I take is 90 or 100, and the core cannot distinguish between 90 and 100. I will show you how it works in precise examples later. So you see that the, the contract includes a clause that cannot be enforced, right? It's not a vague clause. It's very precise. It's so precise that it cannot be enforced. So you see, it's not a terminological distinction. Francesco, okay. there is a question, um, a clarification question. Yeah. Uh, somebody, uh, Alexander Rodilo asks, what does it mean for a breach to be secret? Is it common knowledge that the party violates? Yes, however, it is not verifiable. So, okay, so what does this paper do? I mean, this paper questioned the usual modeling assumption the parties only sign enforceable contracts. Right? I mean, usually when we think about what it means to uh, face some constraints on what can be verified, either because the court cannot verify everything or because some clauses are not legally enforceable, what we do, we proceed by restricting the space of contracts. What I'm gonna do here is different because here instead I say, let's keep the, the space of contracts as it is to start with. So a contract is a mapping from action profiles and states into transfers. And uh, then I, I keep track of how a contingent transfer scheme will be enforced, contingency by contingency. And by doing so, then I can ask, when is it the case that the standard assumption, which is restricting attention contracts that only include enforceable clauses is without loss. And when is it not the case? So when is it not the case? Well, it is with loss in, uh, in uh, some instances that I verify. So in particular, over specified contracts may dominate enforceable contracts when, uh, for, when uh, Transfers are restricted to damage compensation. So you're not allowed to, I mean, impunity transfers will not be enforced, which is actually the standard case. Transfers are based on individual liability only. I will be clear about what I mean later. Or, and this is a little bit more technical, uh, the court's information does not satisfy positive introspection, which is one of the conditions to talk about um, a standard Bayesian reasoning agent. So an agent that bases uh, inference on uh, a partition information structure in a prior. Now, uh, and then subsequent observed information and a distribution over the states. Now, instead, I will show that if call, all contractual clauses are legal in the sense that uh, there are no constraints on what can be enforced because of the law. So for example, um, I can sell myself as a slave, but okay, that's a little bit of an extreme example, but that's the case in which all contracts are legal. I mean, that's something that would not be allowed in a contract uh, to be enforced in, as a contract by the law. Uh, then uh, uh, and, uh, the, the court uh, information satisfies positive introspection then uh, uh, enforceable contracts are without loss. So I don't need to worry about over specified contracts. Now, uh, let me point out in terms of literature review, I already mentioned the work by Luca. I should point out some work by law, law and economist scholars where they point out that, but the example and uh, the construction is different from mine, that indeed over specified contracts may be useful to circumvent limitation motivated by damage compensation. So this is a paper by Edlin published in 1996, when uh, basically the point that it is made is the following. So the fact that punitive transfers, that is transfers that are in excess to the observed damages or the verified damages suffered by the plaintiff are typically not enforced in court. 
is seen by some people as by some scholars as a limitation because the understanding is that okay i mean we should allow all transfers that are in a contract to be enforced if i sign a contract with luca in which i say if i fail to provide a good or quality 100 i will need to pay you 10 million dollars there must be a reason why we sign such a contract and so such a transfer which is punitive because the loss that he suffers is not a million dollars should be enforced in court however other scholars make the point which is the underlying point in this paper that no i mean uh, that this doesn't make any sense because people sign contracts by mistake or they make mistakes when they sign contracts we don't want people to read contracts carefully close by close it would be a waste of time we must have a standard way to prevent people being exploited when they sign contracts and one such rule is the fact that punitive transfers are typically not enforced but then the issue is okay this can lead to inefficiencies and one inefficiency that has been identified in the literature is one of a hold up problem right i mean because of this damage compensation restriction my incentives are not powered enough then that leads to the anticipation of underinvestment on my part and hence on a hold up on luca well, Edlin shows that, in fact, uh, if I make the commitment to overprovide the quality of the good that uh, I will provide, such a, an issue can be solved. Okay, so this is just to say that law and economist people are aware about the possibilities that I studied here. Uh, the other papers are more distantly related, so I will skip them for now because I want to get into the examples. So I will show two examples in which, because of some restrictions of what the force will enforce, if it's signing a contract, the only way to achieve the first best is by using a contract that includes clauses that cannot be enforced. The first example that I will make uh, is based on a principle which is present in the enforcement of contracts with individual liability. So how does it work? It's something that we don't know usually see in contracts, but it's something that instead maybe we should uh, see more often. So imagine that you have two agents who, exert, who may either exert high or low effort and the quality of a good that they provide to a, quality, to a client is high if and only if they both exert high effort. Their individual efforts are not verifiable, but the quality of the good is. Now, our standard way to see this would be to say, OK, not a problem. These two agents sign a joint uh, common contract with the principle in which they are both sanctioned if uh, with, the, with the client, if they are both sanctioned if the quality of the good is low. Is low. So the contract T is such that the client pays a fee F to each agent if and only if the action profile they played is HH. Right? In other terms, the transfer is equal to F if A is equal to HH, the action profile is equal to HH and is zero otherwise. Okay, now what is missing here? Well, what is missing here is that if the two agents are not joined in a single legal entity, say they're not members of a partnership, or they, do, they, they act, each one of them individually, then in practice, and even in law, it will be very difficult to uh, sanction an agent for a contract breach that may have been undertaken by the other agent, right? Say, for example, suppose that this is the example I always use, and it all, usually it works, so I hope it works also here. Suppose that you have to remodel the house and you need a, a carpenter, an electrician, and a plumber. You're not going to hire three professionals separately because if something goes wrong, then they're going to start blaming each other. And it's going to be very difficult for you to figure out who did what and uh, to make sure that the situation is solved. What you usually do, what do you do? You hire a company, right? And this company uh, has 
employs a carpenter, an electrician, and a plumber, so that if something goes wrong, you have a single legal entity, the company, or the partnership, or the intermediary, doesn't matter, against whom you can proceed legally. You know you, who you can sue. You don't want to be in a situation of suing three people without knowing who did what, right? Now, one way to model this is uh, what I call here individual liability, in a sense uh, that I will define more precisely in a moment. Uh, this means that an agent cannot be held liable for, an, for the, in this example, an agent cannot be held liable for the other agent's action. And uh, one consequence of this is that they sign individual contracts with the, with the client. Now, as in the example with the carpenter, plumber, and, uh, and electrician, shirking is not easily or effectively deterred, right? I mean, if agent one contractually commits to play A. Uh, Francesco, just, just, uh, just an observation. Let, I mean, let, let, this let really me... is interpretation, I think. No, 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 it's not interpretation. You will see what no, no. no. Let me, let me, let me. Let no, me, look at, look at, uh, hold on, really. I mean, this is not interpretation, but if okay. you let me go ahead, you will see why. But you don't know what I'm going to say. Uh, no, but I know that it's not interpretation. Yeah, but the, the, the point is that they, 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 for, the, for the liability to, to have the same effect as joint liability, you don't need the guy who's restructuring the house, remodeling the house, to, to sign a contract with a joint venture. Uh, the same effect could be had with... Uh, uh, the the guy who's doing the remodeling signing separate contracts, and then the two people sign a side contract with them that is publicly known by the. So you don't you don't need them to form a, a, a joint a joint legal venture. You, you can it's enough that they have a side contract. So these are all individually signed contracts, but they achieve the same effect. Am I wrong? Well, no. Because, I mean, to have the side contract here, if the two guys do not know what the other guy did, they do not know what that means. No, the, I mean, no, the, side, the side contract could be, no, no, no. be yeah. oh, if we're head liable, we split it. Hey, no, but I mean, then you're jointly liable. If something, right, I but, mean, but, it, but they're not forming a legal entity. It's just a side contract. Again, it's interpretation, I think. Okay, okay, no, I mean, I think, no, 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 hold on. I mean, this is not just interpretation. I mean, the thing is this. I mean, if, um, I mean, if agent one signs a, a, a contract with agent two saying that if the output is, is bad, then we both reimburse the, cli the, the client, then, uh, um, I mean, you are in some sense you are you are throwing in joint liability from the from from the back door. Yeah, because, that's, that's what I, I meant. Mean, because uh, agent one has no control of what agent two does and cannot observe what agent two does. Now, in reality, what can happen is this: what can happen is that the two agents, if they can observe what each each one of them does. They say, listen, if the output is of low quality, in first instance, we commit uh, to both uh, reimburse uh, the, the client in equal share. And then we establish in court who did what, because we are capable of doing that. And so we solve the problem between ourselves. But that's a different environment from the one I described. This is an environment in which, in principle, the two agents cannot observe each other's, each other's conduct. And that's the reason why they cannot have the side contract. Uh, I mean, it, it wouldn't make sense for them to have the side contract that you described. Understood. Yeah. Um, however, I mean, your point is well taken that when we think about examples of this environment, uh, one in which you have multi-agent problems, uh, we give for granted that there are ways to solve this individual liability problem. And 
one of them is to appoint an individual that acts to coordinate the others in a way. To, so, for example, to exact all the fines from the others, and so on and so forth. Now, uh, the verifiability assumptions within the group are not something that people usually look at. Whereas what I'm going to talk about is uh, really dependent on that. And I will show you how it, what, what I mean. Now, um, so in fact, you're right. I mean, I didn't anticipate what you were going to say. Uh, that's because usually people make a different uh, interpretation comment that I thought you were going to make. So I, I apologize for trying to at, at least I was original. <laughs> no, very original. No, this is a very good point. The point that you made is a very good point. You caught me unprepared, unprepared but I, I mean, let, let me show you what I did and then you will tell me. Okay, I want to get out of the issue of uh, uh, individual liability in a way that uh, does not involve uh, either the side contract that you propose or forming a partnership or anything like that. I'm not going to claim that the solution is the most common solution. I just want to show that it is possible to do it. And I'm going to uh, consider the possibility that there exists a monitoring technology, which is itself costly. You see how it, this relates to what we were talking about before? So the monitoring technology is costly. I mean, if I monitor the other agent, let's say Angel, because I can see Angel. If I monitor Angel, I pay a cost. Okay? So in equilibrium, I will, we would like not to monitor each other. And, and now you see how this relates to what we were talking about before. And the specific monitoring technology that we are using has the following characteristic. Monitoring is a private action, cannot be directly verified. However, if it so happens that agent I uh, monitors agent J and agent J uh, plays low effort, a verifiable signal, a signal that is verifiable in court, takes the value one. Otherwise, the signal will take the value zero. So to put it differently, if agent I monitors agent J and J shirks, then I can document that J shirked. But if I fails to document that J shirks, it can either be because J exerted effort or because I did not monitor. Okay, this is the monitoring technology I'm considering. It's different from the one that we were implicitly be in invoking before with your comment, one in which we monitor each other for free, right? And this is common knowledge if you're doing so. I mean, here again, monitoring is, uh, is um, Monitoring is a private action. And I'm going to say that this monitoring technology allows to achieve first best regardless of individual or joint liability. Now, this is what the court, this is the information structure of the court. Now, if this element of the information structure, so it's a partition, it's what the court uh, can distinguish. If it is the case that the two agents exert high effort, then the, the quality of the good is high. And the two signals are equal to zero, right? I mean, neither of the two agents can document that the other agent shirked. And this is because, in fact, neither of them shirked. Is this clear? This is the set here, yeah? Now, this is a different set. The quality of the good is low, yeah? But again, it is the case that both signals are equal to zero. So the quality of the good is low, and neither agent can document that the other agent shirked. Is this clear what this set means? So for example, if agent one plays L, low effort, this is associated with agent two not playing M. Yeah? And vice versa. OK? Now, what is the first best? The first best is that both agents work hard without monitoring each other. Yeah? So this is the outcome that you would like to implement. Suppose that agent one commits to work hard without monitoring agent two, and agent two does the same. Under individual liability, does this lead to HN, HN as an equilibrium? The answer is no, 
And here I can finally tell you how individual liability works, how it is defined in this model. So what does it mean that uh, one uh, that the court can conclude uh, that agent one uh, did not do what uh, she um, what she intended, what she committed to do, in fact? Well, suppose that agent one committed to play HN. And the court observes this set of action profiles here. Does this set of action profile allow the court to conclude that agent one did not play HN? The answer is no, right? Because if you look at the projection of this set of action profiles onto the actions of agent one, this includes HN. Yeah. So can the court conclude upon observing this information that agent one did not play HN? The answer is no. And likewise, cannot conclude that agent two did not play HN. And if you think about it, and you just look at the four center cells, action profiles here, this is the same situation that I described at the beginning, one in which there is no monitoring. The agents are just deciding whether work hard or shirk. And if they both work hard, the quality of the good is high. Yeah? I mean, if agent one commits to work hard without monitoring and then shirks, the court cannot conclude that she didn't shirk because she cannot distinguish this action profile from this action profile. Is this all clear? Okay, now let's suppose that the two agents commit to work hard and monitor each other. Yeah. They commit to work hard and monitor each other. I'm going to show that there is an equilibrium. In fact, it's a unique equilibrium in which they work hard, but they do not monitor each other. How so? Well, suppose that agent two is working hard without monitoring agent one. Yeah. This is what agent two is doing. Agent one has to decide whether to deviate from exerting low effort or not. Suppose that she deviates to exert low effort. Yeah. Does the court conclude that agent one did not work hard and monitor? The answer is yes. Because the projection of what the court observes of the action of the actions of agent one does not include action HM. Is this clear? You see what this means, right? I mean, in practice, the quality of the good is low. Yeah, the quality of the good is low because one of the two agents has played L. So either it is the case that agent one shirked or that it is agent two who shirked. But agent one cannot document that agent one shirked. So it cannot be the case that agent one both worked hard and monitor agent two. Because if agent one monitored agent two and agent two shirked, then agent one would be able to show that agent two shirked. Yeah, is this clear? So in other terms, there is no need for the two agents to know what each other did, which was what Lucas side contract in practice requires in, a, in, a, in, a, in an instance of individual liability. In fact, it requires so. In fact, in equilibrium, they don't. They don't know what each other did. They only have equilibrium conjectures. And why? Because they don't monitor. They don't need to pay the cost for monitoring. And uh, in fact, uh, I want to point out, which is the, the case that I wanted to make, is that in this contract, the contract uh, is based on them uh, uh, doing an action. They committed to do an action, but in equilibrium, they do a different action. Right? I mean, they committed to play HM, but in equilibrium, they do HN. Now, look at this is where the in interpretation issue that I. <laughs> second guess you about, and I apologize for that usually comes. I mean, some people will say, well, but in fact, I mean, they, they commit to play HM, but they intend to play HN. So it's just a matter of terminology. 
But no, it's not a matter of terminology because the point is that this contract here, which is the contract with which there is a transfer, which is a penalty if they play law and not if they play H, does not work. Whereas this contract here, in which they commit to a penalty, to pay a penalty to the, to the client, if the action is not HM, works. So it's not a situation in which they commit to play something, but they intend to do something else. I mean, unless by this, uh, one means that they use a contract and then in equilibrium, they do the dif different thing, which is what I'm saying. This is the contract. It's not a matter of interpretation what the contract is. That's, that's a contract that works. And that's a contract that doesn't work. Francesco, can I, can I make an observation more than sure. a question? So obviously the over-specification here is the monitoring. So basically yeah. they, that's, that's what that is. And this relies in a way on the verification technology, the court, in other words, yeah. being non-strategic in the sense that the court takes the contract literally. And, yeah. and so the, the court in a way doesn't understand game theory and, and says, well, actually I do expect monitoring if there is a deviation because that's what you agreed to, yeah. which is interesting. So that, this claim, is crucial, of course, right? Yeah. My claim is that in fact, the court is not allowed to use game theory because a court is not uh, a player. I mean, a court is, uh, is <laughs> it's a machine. Yeah, yeah. That has to is a machine that has to to determine on the basis of what evidence is brought to court on the adherence of legal to legal principle and on the contract that the players have signed what the following outcome in terms of transfers or maybe penalties should be. But the interesting point is that it this helps. Because in this environment, I mean, uh, it works. I mean, there are, I mean, you know, there is a debate in contract theory whether the court should be monitored as a player or not. I have, Bayesian player or not, I have something to say about this. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, uh, and in fact is that it should not be, but the, the point is not originally mine. The point was made by Hume Son Shin a long time ago. So, I mean, here I'm using the court uh, just as a, as a machine, because I think that this is the right way to think about it, I'm taking contracts uh, in the standard definition as contingent transfers. The only thing that I'm not doing, I'm not restricting the contract space to stuff that is verifiable. And then I want to have a way to model the fact that not all transfers will be enforced by courts because there are legal limitations of what the court can enforce. Now, some of these Legal principles are easy to model. So here, for example, to talk about individual liability, the only thing I'm saying is that the usual measurability requirement, that is to say that the transfers need to be measurable with respect to what the court knows, does not apply jointly, but applies place by player by player. On the basis of what the court observes about the player, the court can determine whether the a certain transfer should be enforced or not. That's what individual liability means. In the case of damage compensation, the definition is more involved than I anticipated. I will not be able to show it, but it's in the paper. There are some cases in which instead, this is very easy to do because you just say, look, found limited liability. Well, we just say that the payoff plus the transfer cannot be low, go below a certain threshold. Easy, easy to do. And in fact, it's so easy that it becomes misleading because one is tempted to restrict the actions, the, the, the contract space, right? I mean, if the only thing that I need to do is to impose limited liability, then I just consider contracts that do not violate limited liability. But the point that I'm making is that this doesn't always work. We should consider all possible contracts and we should keep track on what the stipulated contract translates into enforced contracts. And here, signing a contract by which there is a penalty if, uh, unless uh, the, the, the player plays HM, that is to say, the court enforces a penalty if it verifies that, agent, that the agent did not play HM. 
has very different consequences from a contract in which the, uh, the court enforces a penalty if it verifies that the agent did not play H. And this is despite the fact that in equilibrium, HM, HM cannot be distinguished from HN, HN. So this distinction cannot be made in equilibrium. And that's the reason why the contract contains clauses that are not enforceable. They are not enforced. Right? The agent commits to pay a penalty if she doesn't pay HM. In equilibrium, she pays, she plays HN, she doesn't pay any penalty. But that's the only way it works. Is this, do you have any comments? So Luca, again, I apologize for second guessing. So let's go, let's go back for a second. Um, given what the second guess was, I'm, I'm a little offended, I'm joking. <laughs> because it's too easy for you, no, joke, I apologize. Joke, joke, joke. No, 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 but I, let's, I, let's I, go I, back, I, let's I, go back I, to the guy who wants to remodel the house. Yeah, okay. Okay. So for the guy to want to remodel the house to, to sort of trust the situation, quote unquote, that he'll get the 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 kitchen with the electric appliances working. Yeah. In a sense, he has to know all of this. Which, no, I know. I mean, which, is, not which is not an obvious thing to achieve, right? I In the know. same way that it wasn't an obvious thing to achieve uh, that what I was proposing, that these two guys could say, look, we have a side contract, so don't worry. We're not, we're not, we're not individually liable. Really, we're jointly liable because we've got this side thing going on. So I'm wondering, there is an issue... Um, uh, yeah, I, re I remembered your, your student code of honor. That's public, okay? But the, the, in, the, in the contractor's case, I wonder if you've given this any thought. Okay, that's, uh, that's an, okay. There is a reason why I do not talk about remodeling a house as a working example. It is, a, it is an example, I mean, I use it to make the point that we should worry about individual liability. I don't use it as an example of the uh, peer monitoring as a mechanism to overcome the issue of individual liability. Now that, that's, what I, that's what I'm doing here. So I am I'm totally willing to concede that if I need to remodel a house, what I will do, I will just look for a company or for an, for an intermediary and I will not hire the, the guy separately. This is what I would do. Uh, now, with respect to the value of a side contract, it's a little bit difficult. I mean, you know, here, I mean, you're correct that this is a matter of, uh, I don't know if it's really interpretation, but in terms of application, I mean, there are, in, I mean, one could read the side contract as a partnership contract, right? I mean, we form a legal entity such that we are, each one of us is, uh, so basically each one of us contributes to this legal entity. And if there is, a, con if there is a, a case with the client, then the client can sue the legal entity. That's one extreme. The other extreme is that, look, I know what Angel did. So it doesn't matter if you sue me or him because I have a way to get the money from Angel if it's him who screwed up, right? That's the opposite extreme. In between, there can be a lot of stuff. And I mean, this is not the point that I'm trying to make. So, but yeah, no, I mean, uh, I don't want to make the case that peer monitoring would work if you do, if you do something like renovating a house. I have other examples in the paper. One that is maybe the easiest is the one about the code of honor, although it's not empirically very relevant probably. Uh, it's one in which uh, the idea is that, okay, so if you have, I mean, you give a, a take home or an online exam nowadays, uh, and uh, if you see two uh, homework, two, two, two exams that are exactly identical, then you know that two students cheated, but you know who copied from whom. Now, to the extent that the only thing that you want to prevent is people getting an underserved high grade, then uh, uh, you should, uh, this is the only thing that you should include in the code of honor. 
But because of the issue of verifiability, you over-specify the code of honor, and you, just, and don't, you don't say on, that you only do not want uh, uh, students to copy from others, but you include that it's also against the code of honor to make other student copy, so to pass the exam. Okay? So that's an over-specification of, uh, of the code of honor, because passing the exam should not be bad, right? I mean, if I, if I if I already did it, I mean, it's, it's, uh, there's nothing wrong there. And if you think about an environment where, uh, like a dorm, uh, where it can be tricky to check that nobody is copying from you because you leave everything on the computers and stuff, I mean, you would imagine that making sure that nobody copies your work is a costly action. Now, another example that I have in the paper is about the so-called collaborative anytime feedback which is a form of peer monitoring that Amazon uses. And basically, that's a way in which uh, you can tell uh, the management if you see someone slacking, right? I mean, so in principle, you, you, you can see whether other people are slacking because very often you work in open spaces. Amazon, I mean, delivering time is, is, some, is in some senses joint production because if I if I screw up and I deliver with the delay, then I harm every worker, I harm the whole company. So you see why peer monitoring works here. I mean, more generally, peer monitoring is used, is used in practice. And uh, the set, what I'm proposing here is that peer monitoring can be a form of a latent threat, can be used to make people feel responsible for each other's work. So this is the point that I'm making. I'm not going to claim that uh, the mechanism that they identify is, is used precisely in, uh, in reality. Okay. The final example is about the medical code of ethics. Okay, so professional services such as medical, such as the medical one, are based on individual liability, but the code of ethics often set unrealistic standards. So. For example, if you have a patient that suffers from a condition that requires surgeries and rehabilitation therapies, then both therapies are, unless, and unless both therapies are performed effectively, the patient condition will not improve. Then, uh, well, I mean, first thing is that from a legal point of view, neither of the doctors is personally li liable for the other doctor's actions. But at the same time, the doctor's code of ethic has been, ex has been explained includes the duty that she monitors the effectiveness of the other doctor's work. I didn't know this. Now, on the other hand, it is also not usually the case that people invest in such a monitoring activity because it's very costly. So they trust each other. Okay, fine. One thing that here is lining in the background and it's not in my example is repetition. So I'm not, uh, I do not want to oversell what I'm doing. I mean, if two doctors work in the same hospital, it's a repeated game, whereas what I've shown is not, okay? But these three examples are used to make the point that there is something about peer monitoring as a latent threat to make people, people who are individually liable jointly responsible for what they do. And, uh, okay, and then... Uh, Francesco, you, I'm, yeah. I'm just mindful of the time a little bit. Okay, and then, uh, I mean, there is also an example with damage compensation. I don't know what the time is because I cannot see it here. It's 48. I'm, I'm going to give you a few more minutes, but you're, you're probably not even halfway, so. Um, not even one third. Okay, <laughs> very well. So the general model is one. Uh, no, uh, Francesco, just, I, I know we're very short time, but otherwise it's going to go out of my mind. Uh, uh, uh. There is, there is an area of the law, and I wonder, what, I just do not know where this leads, but I wonder whether you thought about yeah. it. There is an area of the law where joint liability is forbidden, okay. period. And that's penal responsibility. Right. right. In all Western countries, penal responsibility is strictly personal. Right. There's nothing you can do to alleviate that. Yeah. And I'm thinking that there must be a good reason, but I can't think of it, uh, in this context. Um, no, thanks for the input. In fact, uh, I mean, this is something that I would like to talk to you about uh, aside from this, if, if you wish, um, because here I cannot do it. Um, 
as a general comment, I think that it would be, I mean, I think that we do not, we do not, I mean, you know, so in law and economics, people make the, I mean, they distinguish between individual liability, joint and several liability, and so on and so forth. But in contract theory, I haven't seen that. And I think that this is something that sh we should take more seriously. It, I don't know. I mean, what anyway, you're, you're short of time. There, there must be something about criminal enterprises that sets it apart. It's not easy to overcome uh, individual liability simply by signing contracts. I mean, it's not something that you can overtake so easily, even in, uh, in uh, contract law. This is my I mean, Also, I'm making the point that with penal responsibility, that's explicitly forbidden. Right. You, you and I can't sign a contract that I go, I go kill someone and then we split the jail sentence. It's, we, it, it cannot be done. It's not. In, in fact, it's a separate crime to, to try and sign that contract. It's yes, called right. being an accomplice. Now, thanks for the comment, Luke. I mean, it's, uh... Anyway, okay, fine. I mean, uh, going back to this paper, okay, in this paper, what I do is what I promised already before. I mean, I take a game, this is a Bayesian game, set of player states, prior, action profiles, types, utility. And then a contract is a mapping from the contingencies, which here are action profiles and states, into bilateral transfers. Uh, so the big deal is that I'm not assuming that the contract needs to be enforceable because they allow contracts to be a function of any possible contingency, even contingencies that the court cannot distinguish. What do I do? And this is similar to what uh, Luca did in his paper with Leonardo and Andy. Although you, you, you were looking at incomplete contracts where I'm looking at over specified contracts, I model enforcement with a function that maps stipulated transfers into enforced ones. So this is the space of contracts. F tells me how every contingent transfer that is stipulated by the parties will translate into, a, um, into an enforced one if taken to court or if there is a bargaining game and so on and so forth. Now, from the bilateral transfers, I derive the net transfers. In the case that all contracts, contractual clauses are legal, the only thing that the mapping F, the function F needs to worry about is verifiability. So the court information takes any contingency into sets of contingency. And it just says that if a contingency obtains, the court verifies that all the contingencies that do not belong to P of A omega did not obtain. Now, by doing things that way, I can include all the stochastic evidence, which is informative of the action profiles of the agent, because I know that for a in in a in a, in a, an incomplete in an ex, sorry in an imperfect information game having nature moving. At the beginning or at the end is the same thing. Right? We can reformulate the game according to, to, to account for that. So what does it mean that the core cannot enforce contingencies that she cannot verify? It simply means that she enforces a transfer when a specific contingency obtains, if and only if the contract pre prescribes the same transfer for all the contingencies that the court cannot distinguish from the contingency that obtained. Yeah. Now, the standard approach would be to assume that P is a partition. It doesn't need to be. And then to restrict attention to contracts that instead of mapping from the space of action profiles and states, map to the set of sets of action profile and states to the partition into, by, into transfers, into either bilateral or net transfers. Right? So now you see in a clear way why what I'm doing is more general than what we usually do. Right? I mean, because I'm not assuming that the court only, that the, the parties only use contracts that can be enforced. Yeah? Is this clear? Okay, now I'm going to skip this in the interest of time. What does it mean that the contract is enforceable? It means that it's a fixed point according to the mapping F. 
What does it mean, therefore, that it's not enforceable? It means that it's over that it's over specified, it means that it's uh, it's not a fixed point. I mean, if you start with the stipulated contract and you you map it through F into the enforced contract into the enforced transfers, you will get something different. That is to say, not all the stipulated transfers will be enforced in court. What does it mean that the strategy profile is achievable with the contract? Well, it means that by using Nash equilibrium of the game, where the utility is modified by the enforced transfers. Notice that this is quasi-linear utility, right? Yeah, quasi-linear transfers. So then I can set up the question, the answer to the following question, can any desirable and achievable strategy profile sigma be achieved with an enforceable contract? So do I need to worry about over-specified contracts or not? The answer is not always because I have examples before and Edlin is, is actually a related example. But when is it the case that I don't need to worry about over-specified contracts? Well, it turns out that if uh, the game and the partition, if the game, if the, Verifiability. So, if the court's information is, is partitioned and there are no legal constraints, or the only constraint is limited by liability, then over specified contracts are redundant. So, I don't need to worry about general contracts. I can just use enforceable contracts. How do I prove this? Well, I start with the following lemma. That is to say, for any game G and over specified contracts are redundant if uh, the mapping F is idempotent. What does it mean that F is idempotent? It means that F of F of T is equal to F of T for all T. So, what does it mean? What, why is this the case? Well, when is it that contracts, uh, over specified contracts, are, are redundant? Well, let's see. Suppose that I start with any contract, any general contract, and then I consider the contract F of T. That is to say, I start with the, any possible contract, and then I consider the contract of transfers that would be enforced in court when the stipulated contract is T. Okay, because I have that F is idempotent, I have that F of F of T is equal to F of T. So F of T as a contract, the collection of enforced transfers that the court will enforce when the stipulated contract is T is itself a contract, yes, but it's also enforceable because F of T is equal to F of T. F of F of T is equal to F of T. So the other point is that if T achieves a sigma, this means the sigma is a Bayesian Nash equilibrium of the game modified by the enforced transfers F of T. But that means that also F of T achieves a sigma because F of F of T is equal to F of T. And so sigma is also Bayesian Nash equilibrium of G of the game modified by F of F of T. Yeah? So in other terms, the reason why with idempotent F, I don't need to worry about over-specified contracts is because if I start with any contract, even an over-specified one, I can use the contract which is composed by the transfers that would be enforced in court when the first contract was signed. It would give the same incentives to players and such a second contract is itself enforceable. Yeah? Then the only thing that I need to show is that when the game, the verify the partition, the information structure is very is partitional, absent legal or enforcement constraints, over specified contracts are redundant. Yeah. Okay, so as an example of this, let me start with the following uh, simple game in which I have. The following contract. Now, this is a contract that somehow gives a different transfers for three different action profiles that belong to the same set of the information structure of the court. Now, this is not enforceable, of course. I mean, these transfers are not verifiable, right? The court cannot distinguish between these three contingencies. So I can it enforce different transfers. But what does the court do? Well, the court takes this contract and changes into a contract 
in which the transfer is constant in each element of the partition information structure. Right? So for example, here, they all become fail grade. But the thing is that this contract here, if the only thing that F does is to change the contract into something that is measurable with respect to the information structure, is this contract here is the same as F of F of T, right? Once you have taken a contract that is not measurable with respect to the information structure, and you make it measurable, if the only thing that F does is making measurable contracts that are not necessarily measurable, then in the second round, it cannot do anything anymore. Is, is this clear? Yeah. So because this is clear, then you know that this is what is going on, that this, this is the proof of the result, essentially, using the previous lemma. Okay. So in Very quickly, term, is this... Is this an this looks like a, you wrote it as a sufficient condition, not as a necessary one, but yeah, I can't think was, of any. Yeah, the necessary conditions are later in the paper, but there is no time. Okay. I don't want you, I mean, I, I think it's important to present the paper. So if you want, I don't know, how much more do you think you need? No, look, I mean, you see, I mean, okay. uh, no, uh, I can, I mean, I, I can tell you very quickly what else is in the paper. Let's do it like that. I will not be able to present it, but I can tell you what else there is in the paper. I mean, one of the points that I'm, the other point that I make in the paper is that, and this point goes back to, to Shane, to, an, to, to an, uh, an earlier paper by Shane, the course should not be, uh, it, is not, it is not a good idea to model the course as a Bayesian player, because if we do that, for example, we have to allow the court to make rulings on the basis of equilibrium beliefs and not on uh, information, not on verifiable information. And that's a little bit uh, against the spirit of having a court, right? I mean, it's, it's not easy. I mean, I don't think that the court was very well in equilibrium. This is what you would have done if I had seen this evidence, you did something else. So I conclude that you did something different from, no, I don't think that sentences are written that way. And in, in fact, uh, uh, it makes sense to think that uh, a court, but also a mathematician who needs to prove a theorem, uses a form of knowledge that does not satisfy necessarily negative introspection. That is to say this form of counterfactual reasoning. But I mean, in order to present this would take time. No? It turns out that another form of introspection, which is called positive introspection or transitivity is the necessary condition that you, uh, you mentioned uh, because there is this way to refine the previous result that in any gain, absent legal constraints, over specified contracts are redundant, if and only if the court's knowledge satisfies no the you know axiom, uh, which is to call transitivity. Now, there is a way to, okay, after proving this, there is a way to generalize the concept of transitivity and get this necessary condition, which puts together the information of the court, the incentives of the players and the legal framework, which defines what transfers can be enforced and cannot. And you obtain from this order here, if it fails to be negative transitive, then uh, uh, what you get is that it's not enough to look at the enforceable contract. So, in particular, this allows to talk about the previous example in the following way. The information structure here is partitional. Yeah, that's, that's easy to see. But the information that the core has about each individual player separately does not need to be partitional. So for example, fix uh, the choice of the second player. If fixing the choice of the second player, if I describe what the core knows, about what one player does, then I have an information structure because I have a mapping from the single action of player one to subset of the sets of action of player one 
through the following relationship, to the relationship that associates to each action profile, the information set associated with the action profile. And to that set, the projection of the set on the action space of the player. So for example, if agent two plays HN and agent one plays HM, then the court concludes that player one has played either HM or HN. If H2 played HN and agent one played HN, then the court observes this set and concludes that player one played either HN, LN, or LM. If agent two played HN and agent one played LN, the court's information is the same as if player two played HN. Uh, no, sorry. H, if player two plays, oh my God, if player one plays HM or HN and player two plays HN, the information is HM, HN. If it's LN, it's HN, LN, LN. Yeah. Okay, so this information structure is clearly not partitional because to this two set is associated this set here, but to this set, to this point here is associated this set here. So these two sets have a non-empty intersection, but they, do not coincide, but they do not coincide. So it's not a partition. In fact, it's not even transitive because, well, HN does not belong to the mapping from ALN, whereas HN belongs to the mapping from ALN and HN belongs to the mapping from HN. So we are back to the necessary condition. I mean, this is what fails here. In this special case, the one of individual liability, the whole concept of uh, transitivity is related to the information that the court has about each agent individually. I'm sorry, I mean, I cannot uh, explain it better than this with the limited time. Now, damage compensation is a whole different example that I don't have time to describe. So I will just conclude by saying the following. Now, uh, the point of this paper is to make the point uh, to study in a systematic way the fact that overspecified contracts uh, that include unenforceable clauses may be needed by the parties to achieve what they want to achieve. And uh, the way that this mechanism is used is by the party signing a contract and then in equilibrium doing something different from what the contract commits them to do. Or in other words, more precisely, signing a contract that includes contingent transfers that in equilibrium will not be enforced. They know that they will not be enforced. And uh, the important thing is that this is the only way in which they achieve first best. So examples of this include uh, the fact that a seller or, a, or an agent can commit to excessive quality of a good that she delivers or excessive effort on different tasks because the transfers that can be enforced in court are limited by the damages, the verified damages that the counterpart can prove in court. And so that the intuition, and I didn't show the precise stuff, the intuition is that, okay, if as a seller I commit to provide the Luca with a quality of quality, with a good of quality 90, and uh, the, um, with a good of quality 90, then uh, uh, I will shirk and produce good of lower quality, whereas if I commit to provide Luca good of quality 100, then in equilibrium, we provide exactly quality nine. And the reason why it works is because Luca, the only way that uh, he has to make me pay something is to prove that he suffered the damage. And because this is a stochastic event and not always he can show that he suffered the damage, then uh, he will need to pretend that I will need to exaggerate the, my commitment to Luca so as to provide sufficiently powerful. And uh, in fact, this is something the lawyers talk about, although, I mean, there is other stuff like repeated things. Now, 
this paper instead, I mean, the idea is to study this matter systematically and, and therefore to identify conditions under which uh, the parties need to sign over specified contracts or conditions in which they do not need to sign over specified contracts. The positive result is that if every, every contingent transfers that are included in the contract can be enforced in court, given that it is verifiable, or if the only constraint is limited liability, then I can prove that we don't need to worry about over-specified contracts, okay? As long as the court's information is partitional or more precise, more, more strictly, it's, it's uh, transitive. However, I show that I show examples in which this is not the case, either because of the damage compensation or individual liability, or, and this is something I didn't show, but it's in the paper, because the court's information fails to be transitive, then uh, you may need to worry about over specified contracts. Okay? So that's, that's, that's the story. Okay, uh, we don't have much time, but Luca, if you have some final comments. Uh... I, I think I spoke enough during <laughs> Francesca's talk. No, I, know, uh, I, I, I find this, no, no, I, I find this very, uh, very interesting. The, 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 the distinction between some of the stuff I did and some of the stuff that's been done before is subtle. And I think the, <clears throat> the examples bring it out uh, as often is the case more than the formal model uh, the full-blown formal models you know um, you, you, you after the third projection you take uh, you know if you, if you get tired of it but uh, uh, it's there, there is certainly a very interesting um, distinction to be made here um, and uh, the I, I find Probably the most fitting example I find the code of conduct, um, and I still would like maybe 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 Francisco and I can get together separately at some point. I still would like to know why there are some areas of the law where joint liability is explicitly forbidden, whereas it helps in most in a lot of cases. We know it helps. Um, no, thanks for the comment. Me, that seems like an open question. No, thanks for the comments, Look, I mean, we should get together on this because it's of independent interest to me. Now, on, in this paper, I just wanted to make the case that even when it is in principle possible to sign contracts in joint liability, it's not an easy thing to do. Eh? I mean, it's not like, um, I mean, as I said, I mean, you know, site, I mean, if it were the case that I could just hire a plumber and electrician and a carpenter with a side contract, I mean, why would I need to worry about uh, hiring a company? I mean, that's, that's what I usually do. I mean, I want to deal with a single person. I don't want to deal with side contracts. And uh, my sense is that uh, there is something about, uh, there is something important about individual liability in all, in all areas of law. Mm -hmm. So, and this is something that is important because in contract theory, we never talk about it. I mean, we always give it for granted that it is possible to sign a grand contract, mm -hmm. in, uh, especially in multi-agent uh, problems. Well, I'm, I mean, I, I, I would be skeptical about that in practice. So, I agree. I mean, in, in, in practice, one of, one, of the, one of the reasons why the, the, the in, 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 as, again, in the contractor case, the, the joint liability is, is good, but doesn't solve all the problems is that it should be called joint limited liability because liability is always limited. And so oh, the, more, the more you put stuff in the same bin, the more the size of the bin matters or may matter. Uh, and so it, it, may not, it may seem to solve the problem, but not really solve it. Uh, Absolutely. No, I agree with you. And there is also the fact that, uh, so, I mean, you know, from the standpoint of law and economics, I mean, there is the following tension because I mean, people think about, okay, I mean, we should allow a contract to do anything. We should even allow a contract to include punitive damages. I should be allowed to say, if I don't, if I don't deliver to you what uh, we contractually agreed, I should pay a disproportionate fine. 
or Angel and I should somehow pay you in any case, and then it doesn't matter who did what. But that's not the way that the things uh, operate. I like the, 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 the world in which we're allowed to perf contract perfectly on everything it is, is a bit like um, the first welfare theorem. It, it, we should know it, but we shouldn't believe it's true. <laughs> But that's, a, but that's exactly what I mean. I think it's very interesting to try and study formally what legal limitations do in the world of contracts. And I think that this is, in some sense, is still understudied. Now, the, 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 contribute, the methodological contribution of this paper is to say that when we do that, we should not proceed by restricting the space of contract. We should keep the contract, the contract space as general, general and we should think carefully about how stipulated contracts translate into enforced contracts. But that is also the message of some of your papers. Right? I mean, it really matters what happens when a stipulated contract is taken to court and the court has some leeway in deciding how to complete the contract. It really matters what the bargaining game is in anticipation of this uh, court game. Right. Whereas the, the, the simple trick on saying, look, I mean, I restrict the space of contract because some things cannot be done, but no, I mean, that, that, that is not right. That's, that's the point. Guys, uh, I'm, I'm going to, uh, because our time is over, 